A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for help for joining us today. I am Judith from URA, and I will be your webinar host for today. Today's webinar is held in conjunction with the Urban Sustainability R&D E-Symposia 2021, which is a year-long series of webinars that will cover research themes and innovation topics in the space of urban sustainability. Our webinar today is titled Cities in the Age of AI, and it focuses on how artificial intelligence can be used to augment and optimize urban planning. We have a very interesting program lined up for you today with distinguished experts in artificial intelligence, computer science, and sustainable design. Before we begin, I would like to invite Mr. Ching Tuan Yi to give the opening address. Mr. Ching is the Director of Physical Planning East and Director Designate of the Design and Planning Lab. Mr. Ching, please. Thank you. A very warm welcome to everyone participating. Uh, Tuan Yi from URA here, and just uh, give you a quick uh, intro. So under the Research, Innovation and Enterprise or RIE 2025 plan, MND Cities or tomorrow, of Tomorrow or COT we call it, is a key R&D program under the Urban Solutions and Sustainability Research domain. So for the next five years, this uh, R&D program aims to fund research to address national challenges, build resilience in the built environment, and secure Singapore's continued success as a livable, inclusive and sustainable city state. Now, this is especially relevant as we continue to tackle various uh, urban issues and transit into a post-pandemic era. The COT comprises various verticals, V1 to V5 as you see it, and horizontals that target different dimensions of the built environment. Today's webinar, we focus on the first key horizontal enabler, H1, Urban Environment Analytics, which is co-led by URA and HDB. So the R&D conducted under H1, we seek to harness latest advancements and technologies to transform the way we plan, design, build, and manage our towns and districts. And we hope that insights from this horizontal can drive improvements in how we understand our people, our activities, our environment, and find new ways to carry out urban planning and design that achieve higher standards of livability and maximize their well-being outcomes for our residents. Now, under RIE 2025, the H1 will focus on two broad themes. So the first is uh, data analytics, modeling, and simulation, of which we have uh, four sub-focus areas in the colored boxes. So first, we have uh, land use activity and modeling, where our aspiration is to understand travel demand patterns, greater appreciation so that uh, land use and facilities planning can be optimized. And second, we would like to establish clearer links between the built environment and its impacts on a person's well-being. With this, we hope to shape our living environment in ways that better support positive well-being outcomes. Third, we aim to better understand the impact of polycenters, uh, which will further add value to our national decentralization strategy. And last, we would like to deepen our understanding of human and wildlife behavior to better plan for our parks, recreational spaces, uh, spaces eco corridors while we manage uh, potential human wildlife conflicts. The second theme is uh, AI technologies for urban planning. As planning is a complex process which needs to be tailored to the local context. Uh, we hope that the R&D here to, we can help to develop decision support systems which improve the base of our planning knowledge the quality of our decisions and with our greater efficiencies. So this is the end of the short intro. We look forward to working with you to push the frontiers of urban analytics research. And we trust that uh, what we have lined up today, that our speakers and our discussion in the next segments will contribute significantly to the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ching, for sharing with us about the research areas of interest under the Cities of Tomorrow Horizontal and Urban Environment Analytics. If you are active in any of the research domains here or would like to share related expertise, do let us know in the feedback survey at the end of this webinar or drop the East Symposia Secretariat an email at the end of this slide. We will now be hearing from our two distinguished speakers who have prepared insightful presentations to share their knowledge and expertise. If you have questions about any of the presentations, we encourage you to post them in the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. And following the presentations, we will have a panel discussion involving both speakers and Associate Professor Hadi Lau moderated by Mr. Bryce Turner. We would also like to introduce you to our live Jamboard set up for this webinar. 
The Jamboard is the place for you to share any comments or reactions anytime during the webinar. You may scan the QR code on this slide to go to the Jamboard, and we look forward to hearing your views. Our first speaker for today is Professor Emerita Stephen Miller, who will share about the potential to augment urban planning with intelligence in responsible ways. Prof Miller was founding dean of SMU's School of Computing and Information Systems for over 13 years and served as the vice provost for research for eight years. Currently, he sits on URA's AI Technology Advisory Panel and is a DP Lab advisor. He's also co-author of a book titled Working with AI, Real Stories of Human-Machine Collaboration, doing case studies of people working with smart machines in real-world business settings. Without further ado, Prof Miller, please. All right, just doing a sound check that I'm unmuted. Here I go to share screen, to the slides, share, launched. Let's see, oops, here we go. All right, there we go. I started off with the belief that the title for today's talk was going to be potential to augment urban planning with AI in responsible ways. Then as I worked on this and got deeper into it, I came to the realization that that was actually not the most appropriate title. And I struck out the with AI part. And I said, the potential to augment urban planning with intelligence in responsible ways. How did I come to that realization? Why did I make that kind of change? Well, hang on to that and let's proceed with the presentation. I'm gonna talk about these four points. You can see them here on the side, a bit about the domain. What do we mean about AI and intelligence and augmenting urban planning? And then uh, some very targeted points about using AI in responsible ways. This slide, actually comes from the URA itself. It is a very nice visual representation on the planning cycle. Now, right now, just focus on the three circles in the middle. Even though you can see them, don't worry about or pay attention to the boxes on the side. And you can see this circular framework where they go formulate, implement to review. So one thing I want to highlight here is in the formulate, this is a 30 year plan. And roughly speaking, I might be off a little bit, but maybe every seven to 10 years, they relook at the 30 year plan. And then they do the 15 year plan and maybe every three to five years, they're doing an update on that. And then every year, of course, there's the busy work of uh, assessing, planning, deciding what things move ahead, the things that they were thinking about a year or two ago, moving them into the uh, pipeline, and then they go through the rest of the cycle. I think in the context of using AI to support urban planning, if we think of this as a clock dial up around from 12 o'clock to three o'clock, these are very long cycle efforts. We make five, 15, 30 year plans Obviously, it's not so easy to take get feedback or the extent to which it's easy, it's very delayed. You, there's a long delay between when decisions are made and when you see the results of the outcomes of those decisions. That has obvious implications for using data-driven ways to do analysis, all right? Now, if we go to, around the rest of the clock dial without going into every point in detail, when they track what's going on on the ground or track what's going on on uh, projects, they monitor the ground or see what's happening in the car parks and see what's happening in the um, sites that they're monitoring. There's all kinds of, of uh, data. So in the, uh, again, clock dial metaphor, the 9 p.m. to up to 12, all kinds of data, very straightforward to do uh, these kind of analytic models. Whereas in the 12 o'clock to three o'clock, the things that have the huge structural impact, because these are decisions we live with uh, for decades, very difficult actually to do because of these long feedback cycles. So just setting this aspect of 
the domain as we think about using AI. We use it to think about all of these different points across the clock cycles. And if uh, even if you're in private sector and you're not doing 30 year planning for the country, you'll still have your own planning life cycle. And the message to the private sector people is figure out some kind of nice visual representation that works for your setting and your time scales about your built environment um, planning implementation life cycle. It's very helpful and helps you in this planning for how to use the new technology. All right, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? Some of you will be super familiar with this. Some of you, you've heard it, you don't really know or very casually. Um, one of the leading thinkers, scholars in the field, a professor at Berkeley, he came up with this very simple yet powerful way to generally describe what artificial intelligence is. It's machines, in particular computational systems, that are able to search, reason, and learn. And you see what it says here about searching. There's reasoning with certain information using logical methods. There's reasoning with data using probabilistic methods and different approaches to learning. And by putting these things together, you get uh, computer systems, algorithms that do what they do, all right? Now, let me go a level down in more depth, and you'll see why in a moment while I'm showing you this. This is straightforward. It is the table of contents of the world's most widely used AI textbook that's now in its fourth edition. The, the name of the textbook is given at the top of the slide. And what I like about this slide is it's got this nice hierarchical way because it's got the high level topic headers and then the subheaders. And, you know, in those numbered areas, number two, intelligent agents, number three and four, and number 21, 22, these are all the methods in artificial intelligence. This is a pretty good way to summarize the areas of AI. Now I'm gonna say something that you might find surprising. For everyone listening on this, both in industry as well as in the government sector, here is my plea to you. Stop, stop using the phrase, we are using artificial intelligence to do whatever. The phrase is not useful, not informative, it's actually dysfunctional because it mystifies what you're doing. So if you don't agree with me, watch this. Let me put forth an argument. Let's say you're one of our private sector commercial entities listening in, and you have some challenge in your company, something that requires some special attention, something where you better take action, you need to make decisions. And some outside investor or important customer comes to you and says, how are you going to address this problem? And you say, oh, I'm gonna use business thinking. Oh, I will use management methods. And like they're real issues to deal with. And this person's gonna look at you like, what are you, a fool? You don't have any idea of what you're gonna do, you know? So when you say, I'm gonna use business methods, it's not so different when you say, oh, I'm gonna use artificial intelligence to do X. The field is so broad and it's got all of these different areas. And then of course they all get com combined into hybrid type systems. And not only that, the definition of what AI keeps changing. Once something has been around for a long time, like um, you know, the way you scan a document and it takes a type page and converts it, you can convert it into um, a digital, you know, capture the text digitally. People forget that's artificial intelligence. We've been using it for 40 years or for a long time. Same with rule-based systems. So maybe not the scientists, but the public at large, the definition of what they consider to be AI keeps moving. So you don't need to know the math. You don't need to be an expert. 
you can explain in plain language, oh, we're using some knowledge-based systems to do some logical fact-checking of the building documents. Oh, we're using some data, and from the data, we're building a prediction model. We happen to be using some type of machine learning. Put it in plain English. Don't mystify it. If you do that, you can't get away with sloppy thinking, and you'll better communicate with your users, both internally and externally. Okay. So let me move on. You'd think when we use the word artificial intelligence, it implies machines that can do things that to some extent have some aspect of intelligence believe it or not the greatest minds who have studied intelligence going all the way back this started about 140 years ago human intelligence obviously there is no consensus definition of what intelligence is now you might look at me and say i don't believe that it's true this is Cambridge University Press, second edition, the Handbook of Intelligence, 50 chapters, several hundred authors, the greatest minds in the field. And you see this uh, uh, little quote, I got to reduce this thing. You see this little quote at the beginning of the book in one of the introductory chapters that Ironically, intelligence is at one time a very successful construct in psychology because of things that get measured, but it's famous for being impossible to define. There is no consensus definition in the scientific community of what intelligence is. So when you bandy the term artificial intelligence, on the artificial side, there's many, many methods. On the intelligence side, it's not crystal clear exactly what you're talking about either. So try and be more specific when you use the term. Now, that's not to say that there aren't a lot of models of intelligence. There's a lot we do know about the nature of intelligence. I'm a big fan of this Professor Robert Sternberg. He has a particular way of describing intelligence. By the way, he makes the point that when we measure IQ, when we do these um, academic tests of achievement, when we do things like the uh, standardized test to get into the university, they obviously measure cognitive ability. But is that really intelligence? Because we know there's very little correlation between those measures and whether somebody's successful at work, successful at life, successful in their ability to adapt to what they need to do to thrive in an environment. So we measure things and we call them so-called intelligence, but there are people like Sternberg who says, most of those things we measure, interesting cognitive abilities, it's not what we mean by intelligence because intelligence is the ability to adapt and to know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are. So I like Sternberg's definition of these four types of intelligence. Most of what AI is being used for today is in this top right box. And even just a subset of that, based on certain kinds of analytic abilities to evaluate, to compare and contrast and evaluate the data-driven models, and even in some cases, the rule-based type of thinking. But even in that top right box, uh, machines are far, far, far away from human ability to critique, to judge, and even to explain. And while machines can play some degree of role in supporting the other areas, practical intelligence, getting other people to follow your ideas, use your ideas, how you contextualize you, uh, your ideas, and the wisdom to know is this something that I should be doing? Is this good or bad, morally or ethically? Um, we're very, very, very far from having machines that could do these things, although in very selected ways, they can support us. I, I happen to be a believer that machines can very much help in the creative process uh, and help in sub-steps to the process. So. I, I think it's a waste of time to say, are machines creative or not? I think more specifically, there are sub-steps of the creative process. Machines can help in looking for alternatives, generating new kinds of options. 
and then they help the decision maker who through their values will make the final choices. All right. Now, when we're using tools uh, that have the potential to automate, we need to ask ourselves, what's our strategy? Are we trying to get the labor out? Are we trying to displace and fully take over the task? And to the extent that we are gonna use a human, it's, it's in the outer loop, right? And we're really replacing, getting rid of the humans doing the actual task. Or is it in augmentation mode where we don't work with fewer people, we work with the people that we have, the humans still do the uh, collection of tasks that are the various jobs, but they work in partnership with machines such as AI support systems, and we're able to get more done in a given unit or time, or we're able to do things that we couldn't do before. Now, in the built environment, uh, we'll see some examples where we can automate, but they're not going to be a lot of examples. Most of what we're going to see is augmentation. In this series of 29 case examples I did with Tom Davenport, most of what we saw was augmentation, only a handful automation. I have gone through cover to cover in minute detail, everything written by the MIT Future of Work Project, which did a worldwide scan of the impacts of um, AI and uh, robotics. And again, what they found was, um, yes, some degree of automation, but much more augmentation. And also that it moves very slowly in the sense that even though the technology moves quickly on the R&D front, the way it gets deployed in any kind of organization moves at a much slower rate because organizations are very complicated entities to get things done and to change things. All right, so the focus is going to be on augmentation and the traditional story by traditional the story you would be expecting me to say is to say well we're going to use more ai methods getting down to those specific methods that i spoke about earlier and um we're gonna you know build more models we're gonna get more data we're gonna build more models both the logic-based type as well as the data-driven type and we're just going to keep doing more and more of that. I'm going to comment on that in a moment. That's one form of augmentation. It's underway. My message from this slide is, if that's the only way we approach augmentation, we will never be able to address some of the key questions that Chuan Yi talked about under the urban analytics thing where he he talked about under the modeling and analysis there's a lot of understanding they want about uh behavior patterns and travel patterns and whatnot right there's other bodies of knowledge other types of disciplinary uh, mindsets methodologies and tool sets that we need to pull in to what ura hdb you know, the public sector people working on a built environment are doing to augment AI can help some of them. But what I'm saying is it's got to be more than just going deeper on that list of AI methods that I showed you earlier. All right. I am personally quite comfortable with the path that the URA is on. Now I'm showing you this same life cycle diagram, and I want to pay attention to those boxes in the outer ring. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but I'm just going to help explain that. So within URA, in consultation with other built environment uh, agencies uh, under MND, um, they've selected sub areas to say, where can we try and enhance our ability to um, either understand what's going on or to make decisions. And that's what these rectangular boxes are. So what I like about this diagram is they have their model of the life cycle, just like all of you will have some model of your built environment related activities, some life cycle model. And in each part of the life cycle, they select it out where do I want to try and enhance my capability 
in the technology projects. And in thinking about enhancing capability, they have two dimensions along which they're trying to do that. One dimension is sense making and explanation. What is it that's happening out there on the ground? Why is it happening that way? So I'm not trying to predict, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to, in some ways, explain. And then the other side of it is, is prediction and decision-making. Anytime you have to make a decision, you're in essence making a prediction because your decisions are always based on your assumptions of what's going to happen after you make the decision. As we discussed earlier, URA has various time cycles for which they need to make these decisions. So my recommendation to the uh, commercial sector people who maybe are in the earlier stages of doing this, lay out your life cycle and your key processes, identify a few places where you have the data, where you think that it can help you, will there be some cost benefit to going ahead with one of these technology projects? No project is too humble. Uh, if you're doing this new and you're early on in your experience cycle, the simpler a project you pick, the more likely you are to succeed. And then somebody will say, well, why are you trying to do that with this new technology? It's so simple. You're trying to get your footing. You're trying to get on your own learning curve of building up your capability for operating in this space. And then as you get smaller scale, simpler, successful projects behind you, you'll move forward. So working with BCA, with IMDA, um, you can get support for getting going on these issues. All right. And then for the people who are already quite experienced on this, you might want to pay attention to some of these new areas that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So above and beyond just we need to do more with AI methods. URA and the whole government built environment uh, ecosystem, they already pay attention to experiments, right? We already know that Singapore has been good with systematically thinking through experiments. But a lot of the things Chuan Yi talked about in the RIE 2025 thing, where they want to understand living patterns, more analytics per se won't get you there because you, you need an understanding of causality. So one of the downsides of all the additional data and the new and the better techniques is it's easier to find correlations. And we all know, or we should know, that correlation does not equal causation. But the fact of the matter is, when you do the analytics and you see these strong correlations, you cannot avoid jumping to the conclusion of causation. And usually or often, the, the correlation is not causal. There's something else going on. There's other variables behind the scenes. You need to know how to tease this out. And to be honest, the social science people have better experience in tooling than the engineering people, the technology people, and even most of the computer science people for doing these kinds of things. So experiments at large field scale have become part of the business repertoire for more sophisticated companies. Sometimes you cannot plan experiments. You just don't have the control. But something happens, like COVID happens, and there's a before and an after. Or sometimes we could have two HDB blocks, and they're on opposite sides of the street. And they're very similar, but some policy change happens on one that didn't happen in the other. That's an example of a natural experiment. And in 2021, the Nobel Prize was awarded to three economists who worked out over the years vastly improved methods for how to disentangle data to get to causal relationships in what are called natural experiments. They're just things that happen large scale in these real world environments. Now, are our 
people in URA and the, the, the design and planning lab expert in this? No. Is it easy to gain expertise in this? It would take a long time. So whether you're in private sector or whether you're in public sector, establish the working relationships, both with the social scientists locally in Singapore and internationally, who can help you disentangle these relationships as you get more data and do more analysis, right? Simply more AI models will not get you to understanding causality. They'll give you more examples of strong correlations and they can help with certain types of prediction, but that still is not giving you the insight into causality, all right? And then the 2019 Nobel Prize illustrates that you can do very complex, large scale field experiments. And those people got the Nobel Prize for that. All right. Now, the other area where I think we need to augment our intelligence, where AI can help us, but alone by itself is not the answer, is dealing with the future, which is inherently uncertain. And as you go out 10 years, 20 years, many things are unknowable. So there's a lot of information in this chart, but I'm gonna simplify it as following. The first column represents the world where we have data to do forecasting and the kinds of things we're trying to forecast, we believe it's reasonable to use the existing data that we have and to extrapolate learning curves, right? And I talked to one of my SMU colleagues who's world renowned for doing econometric based time series forecasting as I was preparing for this talk. And he shared with me how he has been studying machine learning methods in recent years, and they really are helping him do better forecasts and develop uh, forecasts for like one year out, two years out, three years out, related to complicated things on financial markets. And he's doing this under sponsorship from Monetary Authority of Singapore, and it is helping. So there's one example of where machine learning methods are helping us forecast the future. But when we go 10, 20, 30 years out, there are many things we need to forecast about where we cannot extrapolate existing data or we don't even have the data or we're trying to think through scenarios about a future and a structure that doesn't even exist yet. And the other two columns represent approaches of systematically working with expert judgment. And you can't just like go ask an expert. There's a well-developed set of methods for how you elicit, for how you build probability distributions, for how you work that into modeling scenarios, for how you propagate the effects of that uncertainty. I know the URA, for example, follows the work of the Santa Fe Institute in complex systems modeling. That is just one approach. They need to also pay attention to these other approaches. Now, we know it's all the rage to talk about big data and to say, well, the data will keep on getting bigger. By big data, more specifically, we mean there are many, many attributes in the data and many, many observations. We might have hundreds or thousands of attributes. We might have millions or tens of millions of observations. And indeed, with that, we can do better and better and better predictions. But the thing is, you can only predict things that are similar to all the data that you're based on. So some very smart people who have looked at this in detail have come to the realization that big data will get bigger, will get better. And indeed, the AI algorithms with big data outperform humans for what we call typical cases, things where the future is very similar to what's happening now in the past. But URA has to do forecasting of things where the future is not like what it is currently and not what it was in the past. This um, uh, qualitative researcher, Trish Wang, 
created this term called thick data. And these are the small samples, the stories, the more nuanced understandings embedded in narratives and stories. And it turns out that there's a growing body of evidence that this kind of thick data with the small samples and the more qualitative approach seems to be better with understanding discontinuities, understanding things where the structure is really changing. So remember, we need a combination of big data and thick data. So that's the message of this slide. Personally, I would like to see the Center for Livable Cities, which already does some of this type of so-called thick data work, even do more and more of it and do it in a more systematic way in ways that will partner with the big data work. All right, now when people talk about responsible AI, usually what is in mind are these different acronyms, feet, fat, and fate, and you can see the words. Basically, they mean the same thing, and just different sub-communities did the acronym a different way. For example, when the Monetary Authority of Singapore put out its guidelines for responsible AI, they used the FEAT as shown there, fair, ethical, accountable, transparent. Some of the um, international computing associations like the, uh, the, the big um, Computer Science Research Association, they have now a special interest group in what they call a, a fair, accountable, and transparent, FAT, all right? So this is really important. It's like a whole one day or one week workshop all in itself. I'm actually not so worried about this. It's important. I'm not understating its importance. I'm not saying that it's easy, but I think increasingly people are on the bandwagon that, hey, I you know, assign someone in the company to go find out about this stuff. I did a write-up as part of this Tom Davenport book with a very small team at Salesforce. It was only a handful of people, two in particular. And that small number of people were able to bring in methods, bring in frameworks, help bring in tools, and help thousands of other engineers figure out how to contextualize the meaning of this. So a small team can help make this real and executable in any kind of company environment. So just go find out about this stuff. Do the Google search for these acronyms. And there's plenty there. I like the person from Salesforce who said this work on responsible AI is sort of where we were with cybersecurity in the 80s. Everyone knew it was important and people were doing things, but compared to where we are now, they didn't have the methods, they didn't have the frameworks, there wasn't this broad global ecosystem and the talent base. So the work in responsible AI is moving that way. The aspect of responsible AI that I'm more worried about is people not fully understanding the limitations of the AI machines vis-a-vis -vis, um, humans and making some mistakes in that space to me is more likely to result in accidents and undesirable things. I think on the top part, as important as it is, people know they need to work on it. But let me just give a simple example. How many times, I've done this many times, I've been in a grab or a taxi, and I say to the guy or the lady, that, that was a funny turn, why did you do it? And they say, well, you know, the system told me to do it. And they just sort of stop using their brains and the GPS said did it. Actually, it wasn't the GPS, it was the algorithms uh, <laughs> guiding the navigation. So, this this bit that we're using these tools and how do we understand their capabilities and limitations so we sort of know when to intervene, when not to intervene, how to partner so that we do it so that our input makes the machine smarter, the machine's outputs make us smarter. And just as a summary statement, 
we know with these methods, we can do predictions, classifications, choices, optimizing choices, risk minimizing. As long as the present is similar to the past, indeed the algorithms can perform at levels that exceed human consistency and human accuracy. So it's, it's sort of obvious there are a number of things we can do better with these machines, but it is worth reinforcing. If you look at these items on the right, common sense understanding, understanding the plausibility of causal explanations, understanding context, understanding intent, especially when you can't just go search for it on a website, understanding when the rules of the game have changed, understanding where we need to reframe, how to bridge from a current environment to a new environment, how to assess and explain a new situation, how to set the standards for quality, defining the objectives. These are all these thick data-like things and our current machines and our best research, not that they can't hit on a bit of this, a bit of that in these items, but they're so far away from it, you're not gonna see this in your lifetime. So it reminds us that we have to have this combination of our human intelligence, our machine intelligence, and that's it. I'm all done in our context of urban planning. I look forward to how the private sector people in the built environment as well as the government sector people are going to move forward on these experiments of how we put human and machine capabilities together. Thank you. And over back to the seminar leads. Thank you, Prof Miller, for your sharing. Next, we have Associate Professor B.J. Tanser from SUTD's Architecture and Sustainable Design Pillar, who will share about responsive urban planning with AI. Prof Tanser leads the Informed Design Lab at SUTD, which examines how behavioral hypotheses can be drawn from urban data sets to inform urban planning and design. Without further ado, Prof Tanser, please. Thank you very much, Judith. And, and, and thanks very much for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. It's an honor to be here. And also, it is wonderful to follow Professor Miller in this webinar. So I'm going to now share my screen. Is it visible? All right. So uh, as Judith mentioned, I lead the Informed Design Lab at SUTD. We are a multidisciplinary group. We have architects, software engineers, data scientists, other types of engineers, and we almost always in all the research collaborate with social scientists. So this talk is about responsive urban planning and design. And I want to talk a little bit about socio-technical systems where the technical aspect of the system that is being developed, the hardware, the software, the technology, needs to be coupled with the people, the culture, the characteristics of the people. So when we see cities as a systems of systems and as a cities also as complex adaptive systems, and when we uh, agree, uh, hopefully, that in design and planning, the context is situated, the problems are situated, even though there may be commonalities. So we, we build situated design and planning support tools. We need to put humans and, and sometimes animals and nature in the center of our computational methods and tools. So in this context today, I will be talking mainly about three points, where data can play a role in urban design and planning because there is no AI without data, how this data can be made useful for urban design and planning, and this is where AI comes in, and how designers and planners can interact with the data where AI would answer questions, find patterns, plan scenarios, predict outcomes, etc. Uh, so AI depends on data. The quantity of data is important, especially for some AI techniques such as deep learning. But the quality of, of data is also important, where the data is coming from, the source of the data, the type of the data, the reliability of the data. In addition to classical uh, data collecting techniques, classical, the ones that have been used uh, with, by social scientists, especially for a very long time, surveys, workshops, etc. 
there is this urban big data that we use uh, a lot in our data analytics uh, methodologies. Some of these sensor data from all types of urban infrastructures, transport tracking data, social network data, such as Twitter and Instagram, public app data, user volunteer data, open street map, phone data, and also a large set of open data that is made public by many, many city administrations around the world, such as air pollution, crime, meteorological data, land use data, and many more data sets that we can think of. This data is qualitative and quantitative, big and small. For example, in the national science experiment, we built a, a whole bunch of sensors, which were worn over 90,000 students and were, uh, were uh, used by, by about 265 schools. The sensors, as you see here, measured many different things, uh, temperature, humidity, noise, light, uh, location, and many more uh, attributes. So the students, the, the, ped the pedagogical aspect of this was to uh, nudge students towards STEM. Um, and this was rather successful. It had a very large pedagogical component. But as the students wore these sensors around their necks, a huge, huge, huge amount of data was collected. So this is a quantitative data resource, a huge quantitative data resource for us and other researchers and also government agencies to dip into. So we looked at the transport modes of the students. How do they get to school? Uh, how do they come home from school according to the age ranges? What could be the reasons of their choices to walk or to, to take other transport modes? What are the reach of the, of the different schools? Uh, there was also uh, using the, the button on the sensor, the students could record their happiness. And then we did various analyses on how this happiness could be correlating to various urban features, to uh, air conditioned spaces, non air conditioned spaces, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we also built some visualizations which can assist the users to interactively look at the combinations of these findings using the national science experiment data, which makes it much more accessible. In another example, uh, an ongoing PhD research by Katerina Konieva, she is looking at the role of information technologies in design collaboration processes within interdisciplinary architecture, engineering, construction teams. And she got her hands on this huge, huge amount of data, which is made public by European city, the approval uh, agency of the city, where there are thousands, millions of documents that are publicly made available, which show the communication in a project approval process. So the communication with the agency and the communication between different firms. And from this, we could detect the individual affiliations of the individual people working in these uh, submissions and also how, the how these connections uh, are within and between organizations and their networks. Um, we could also uh, look at this over time. So all the milestones or delays in the, in the approval process, et cetera, how this links to these communication patterns. Again, very, uh, in fact, qualitative information, the communication notes and the approval documents, et cetera, but turned into an, an analysis for a very qualitative type of uh, analysis. In another project, also ongoing project, PhD project by Jam Otaman, he is looking at creating a post-participation toolkit for qualitative citizen participation. So this is very, very qualitative data because a lot of cities around the world are doing participation exercises, especially in the early stage of, of a, 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 a plan, a design or a plan, to do goal setting with the uh, participation of citizens. And there are many platforms to do this where people do proposals, debates, they write comments, etc. So cities do this, but according to his research, none of the cities who do this are able to use these data because it is a vast amount of data. The structure is not suitable for designers and planners to gain insights from it, to turn it into something that is usable, that is injectable into the process. So he's using AI, uh, natural language processing and other techniques to create a post-participation phase in this process where a, a schema 
can be uh, created and a toolkit can be created uh, such that this data can be presented to the planners, designers, that it can be actually useful for the, for the process. So this qualitative and quantitative big and small data, uh, how can this be useful for designers and planners? Because in their processes, designers and planners switch bet between various scales and they also frame and solve various problems consecutively, also simultaneously. So therefore, uh, providing designers with multi-source, multi-scale and multi-time data information and the evidence gained from this is the best way to approach data-driven design. So in this context, the selection of which data sets should be collected or used for which context and application becomes very important. A combination of, just like what Professor Miller said, big data and thick data, a combination of qualitative and quantitative small and big data would actually work much better in gaining an understanding or even predicting. In this project, Pedestrian Comfort in Crowded Walkways, uh, we worked with uh, designers, transport engineers, and cognitive psychologists with the goal of understanding how the design of transport-oriented development in Singapore, meaning ma major crowded MRT stations, uh, how these, the design of these can be improved in order to alleviate the stress or the discomfort that is caused by our growing population. So we did a, a network uh, audit of all the links and did a, uh, an estimation, a prediction of pedestrian flows, we did many on-site experiments uh, with people for wayfinding, for comfort studies, using also physiological sensing, and repeated these in, in the lab with VR uh, environments to, to, to make changes to the design that, that we could measure quite well methodologically. We did a preference study with selected design parameters to, to gather data about people's preferences of various uh, design uh, parameters that are coming from literature, etc. And from this, we came up with a design uh, recommendation or design guide, uh, which is structured around the, which is structured around these design parameters. And also we finally built a, a dashboard in which the, the planners can uh, adjust the levels of pedestrian flow, level of service and comfort which is which these are computed from all the data that is collected in the project and see some of the values and select and filter these links according to uh, investigate the links according to these parameters so the challenge here is which behavioral hypotheses can be drawn from specific urban data sets and their combination and what is the relationship of these hypotheses with spatial and organizational aspects of urban spaces so can we integrate data, big or small data, user preferences, and planner and designer knowledge, this is the expert knowledge, for urban design and planning support? So in this context, we would like to go from data-driven design and planning to design and planning-driven data, where architects, urban designers, planners working with data destroy disciplinary silos, Buildings actively participate in urban systems producing and using data. Design is primarily seen as a process which includes stakeholder participation, placemaking, collective learning with data. And architects, urban designers, planners become mediators in this process, in addition to being the creative force in, in coming up with the solutions. Uh, Evidence-based design and planning support uh, so designers and planners use evidence from existing situations and they gain insights to improve these projects and also gain insights for new designs. However, this evidence can never lead to a linear translation into a design and planning solutions. At least this is not the case at this moment. However, this process can and does replace some of the assumptions made during design and planning by grounded evidence. And the combination of the multi-time, multi-source, multi-scale data really helps to do this. AI applications assist in making this collection of data valuable. Um, how designers and planners would interact with the data to make sense of a combination of these data sets. 
And in this context, AI serves a meaningful way of inclusive planning and de design decision making beyond merely prescriptive conclusions. Planners can ask questions to, to gain an understanding of the situation that the AI can answer. AI can do scenario planning and prediction, or at least help to do scenario planning and prediction. And a cooperation between the AI and human can yield better and more informed outcomes. We use in these projects many data processing analysis and AI techniques, among uh, others, multivariate analysis, natural language processing, text mining, computer vision, and forms of machine learning. And the platforms and the applications that are produced by my lab and many other researchers and, and companies around the world span multiple design and planning scale, scales from the city to the street scale. If I may show a few examples in my remaining time, which I will check right now. Uh, at the city scale, I will talk about the work of a previous PhD student, Ludovica Tomarchio. She was interested in how social media affects the production and consumption of art and how the structural effect can be uh, a guide for uh, current modern cultural planning policies. So in order to do this, we had collected data from a social media platform, Twitter, over three years. And we detected the topics and filtered the, the feeds that talk about art. And we mapped these to the uh, art locations in Singapore that received funding from the government, some sort of subsidy. And we mapped these. And we derived three categories, confirmation, which means the art places generate a huge amount of conversations. Negation, which means the art places generate very few conversations and discovery, which means these places don't receive government funding, but generate quite a substantial amount of art conversations. Then from this point, she produced a, a very large amount of maps that would help policymakers, curators, and other stakeholders to understand the situation and guide their cultural planning, made many interviews, and she did some computer vision analysis uh, on images from Instagram to see what the pictures taken in these art spaces are focusing on. Are they focusing on people, art, or the space itself? And she came up with a whole bunch of recommendations for cultural planning. In another PhD project, Özgün Balaban was interested in the comparison between walkability and runnability in a city. So he took a, a large data set from a prominent fitness application and in Singapore over um, multiple years. And he mapped these uh, into a, an explanatory process, how what happens, which streets are most popular, uh, what happens during days, nights, et cetera, et cetera. Doing a climate analysis in Singapore, of course, doesn't really make sense. And she, he got the street network, uh, some satellite images for green analysis, land use data, uh, socioeconomic uh, neighborhood data, as well as Google Street View images to analyze what is what people see at the eye level in different segments of the of the running path. And an analysis on a grid as well as a network based analysis was done, correlating different urban parameters to the running data. And uh, some conclusions were made some differences that were found between walkability and runnability in a city. In the neighborhood scale, we had a, a project where the goal was to understand use, usage pattern, patterns, use, users' assessments and opinions as designed versus as utilized understanding for a neighborhood. So some questions that, that designers and planners uh, would ask this system could be which spaces are being used, who uses them, are they over or underutilized, etc. The site for this project was the Yuha district as well as the neighboring gateway area. So we did an urban mapping and analysis, then determined what the points of interest are and mapped these and located these into our database. We installed sensors on site over phases for both environmental sensing as well as people counting. We built an app which does the GPS following on, on um, you know, micro scale, as well as an interface on top of that in which people can uh, qualitatively rate 
uh, the, these different places that they visit and spend time in. We got some data from Telco to, to look at footfall and flow between different parts. And we did a survey, also various workshops with the residents to gain a deeper understanding uh, when it comes to this, you know, the, a, a more deeper understanding, maybe understanding some sort of preferences and even uh, wishes of the residents in a much more direct way. We also looked at social media data and sentiment and topic analysis to see what kind of places are, uh, how, how they are behaving. Finally, we merged all this data uh, according to a model of places, timeframes, and people's demographics. And we can analyze and visualize this according to utilization patterns, activity patterns, opinions, and the census. So this was built into a platform where the uh, in user interface and user experience kind of mimics the model that I just showed. And it resulted in a, play, in a platform in which people can gain a deep understanding of what is going on in all these places. For example, the activities that, that take place in highly utilized and, and lowly utilized playgrounds, how this, uh, how this then links to the various activities in which time of the day, uh, the ratings of these playgrounds, meaning the people's opinions, and the uh, uh, various qualitative suggestions, positive, negative, and neutral of the people through the workshops and survey. And then we can come up with such recommendations uh, for this type of playground. Or we can understand patterns of what are the public space activators and what in the vicinity needs to be there to make these more well used uh, and, and more uh, utilized and, and having better uh, scores for livability by the, by the residents. Oh, I am way over time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip all this and go to the conclusions. So in this example, uh, what we did is we actually looked at, we can gather all this data and make these conclusions from uh, existing situations, but is it possible to predict something, to model and predict something for a site where there is nothing? So we built this visit potential model, which estimates the pot potential presence of people in public spaces. And we started touching upon the effect of urban design quality on this potential. So we built the environment using population objects, which are buildings, attractor objects, which is commerce and culture, and transportation objects, which is public transportation and private cars. We built the, the space as a, in a graph representation. We have a calculation model. And we uh, employ multi-criteria decision analysis to rate the spatial qualities. And the outcome, which we never got to do yet, would be something like this, where when you are assessing some public space, you could look at it from different points of view and change the weight of the different criteria, the parameters that you are looking at, to be able to assess it from different viewpoints. And it is not only one thing, but it can mean many different things. And we tested this, we calibrated this with the existing data, and we tested it uh, on two different designs for a, for a new design, for a new master plan, um, to demonstrate how it works and if it makes sense. And we're coming to conclusions. Um, Design and planning are situated, but the transfer, transferability using these data uh, analysis and AI techniques, transferability between contexts is an open question. And the balance between automation and augmentation must be carefully considered, depending on the context and the application. Also, in the context of design and planning, I believe that transparency is, an, is, a, is quite an important aspect to consider for socio-technical systems because um, architects and planners are actually used to understanding the causes of things. So we need to be able to question why the model says what it says. Therefore, transparency is actually quite important for these systems to be adopted and to be successfully used. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Tansa, for sharing with us about responsive urban planning with AI. 
Our final program for today will be the Q&A panel discussion with our speakers, Prof. Miller, Prof. Tansa, and Associate Professor Hadi Lau. Prof. Lau is an Associate Professor of Computer Science at SMU, where he directs the Computer Science Bachelor's Program and leads the Preferred AI Research Group on AI and Machine Learning. We are also honored to have Mr. Bryce Turner as the moderator for this panel. Mr. Turner leads the strategy and insights practice for Arup Australasia, and he is an economist and strategy consultant with over 16 years of work experience in management, technology, and sustainability consulting. To all participants, we welcome you to field questions through the Q&A function and vote for your favorite questions. Over to you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Judith. Actually, you can call me Bryce Richard. Turner must be, must be my evil twin from, uh, from uh, another <laughs> company. <laughs> but Turner sounds like a pretty cool last name. I wish it was called Bryce Turner. Uh, very nice meeting you, everybody. Um, so the, the, the panel, uh, of course, has shared incredible insights um, uh, today. Uh, very, very deep conversations on, on AI. Um, and there's a lot of questions that are being asked around. So I, I will actually uh, jump straight into some of the questions that are being asked by the, the audience, uh, opening it, of course, to the, to the, to the broader uh, floor. But I think this one really uh, talks about um, the, the concept of, uh, of uh, augmentation versus automation that, that both Stephen and, and Bigay talked about. So the question is, most of the jobs to be done in the urban planning are very qualitative and very uh, contextual. So would it be right, uh, Stephen and, and Bigay, to, uh, to say that most of our AI system within a planning standpoint will serve more an augment function rather than an automation function? What do you feel? Stephen, you're, you're on mute. Even within a lot of sophisticated knowledge jobs, there's often a lot of grunt work and tedious work of uh, getting information, gathering, gathering it from different sources or putting it together so you can uh, visualize it. And BGA gave some examples of some systems that can do that. So at the micro task level, you'll see op opportunities for automation, but there'll be at the micro task level. If you think of it at the job level, it's, I, I predict with a very high degree of confidence, it will, it will very much be an augmentation set of thing with task specific uh, uh, opportunities for so-called automation. Good, Bigay and Hadi, do you, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I, I agree, but some of the, the tasks, uh, repetitive tasks and grant work as as professor miller put it i agree but in in other in some other context automation can also be useful uh, which is not grant work in a way that maybe uh, these uh, tasks would benefit from automation in the sense that the same process applies in many different contexts and then automation can also help in a, in a more meaningful way. Great, Hadi? Yeah, so uh, I, I kind of think that a lot of the tasks uh, in the planning, for, I mean, for example, the word planning itself, I mean, in, in AI, there is a branch called planning, but a lot of times when we talk about planning technologies, we actually talk about low level planning. I mean, like the most sophisticated one, probably like self-driving, but even self-driving, uh, probably most 18-year-olds in the world will be able to learn self-driving, but mm. land planning is a lot more complex than that. And they need to uh, pick up a lot of background uh, knowledge as well. So, so I would actually suppose that some of the most cognitively complex uh, tasks in terms of planning would even benefit from uh, even search uh, uh, technologies. I mean, if people don't always imagine it in that way, but uh, for example, uh, Google, like the search engine itself, is uh, an application of AI and machine learning. Mm. And that allows us to augment the human capacity in a very general way. I mean, a lot of people use Google, no matter what profession they are. Uh, but uh, in that case, right? I mean, like even doing site search, for instance, in terms of planning, uh, surfacing what sites might be useful or might be promising and so on, uh, likely is going to involve some form of uh, looking at precedents in terms of the previous cases mm. and intelligently uh, analyzing how they can be applied in newer contexts. 
Mm. But expecting AI to automatically do that, I think it's kind of hard because even mm. if you think about what humans do, if you were to teach planning, land planning to another person, I don't think this is something that is easily codifiable mm. in terms of like a set of recipes that we can actually follow. Or even if you learn them, it takes a long time to learn them. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, your, for your thoughts on this one. Um, another question that, that, and actually it's popping up in a couple of places, uh, relates to really one of the key challenges that Singapore is trying to tackle as a nation is, is skills, skills development, skills attraction, skills retention. And of course, AI requires a lot of very deep specific skills but to, 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 and, and, and people with the right skills to, 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 to be successful. Uh, in that regard, what do you feel are the critical skills that right now uh, from an AI standpoint, uh, exists in Singapore, either, you know, uh, in, in other industries, not necessarily being applied to planning, but in general, and what do you think are the key gaps and potentially some of the skills related challenges that, uh, Singapore as a nation would have to tackle in order to successfully develop, um, you know, very strong AI practitioners and professionals being in urban planning or, or more broadly speaking, do you have any thoughts on that? Hadi, why don't you go first on that? I mean, that goes way beyond the scope of this seminar and Hadi, to the extent that you want to contextualize or just take it in general, but uh, you know, you run a program specifically targeted on this. Right, um, so a lot of times uh, when we think about AI related skills, I, I would actually think that one of the most important uh, skills to pick up is understanding what AI technologies are capable or not capable of. Mm. or even the current state of them. And uh, because a, a lot of times when we think <laughs> about uh, using AI, I mean, uh, Steve commented on, on using specific technologies and branches of AI, uh, that actually involves a very specific uh, type of skills. I mean, like for, for example, if you talk about learning, that essentially is, is understanding systems that can improve over time. And uh, improving over time uh, itself, it's a, it's a particular skill in that sense. Mm. So, so uh, in, in general, I think uh, I would say that uh, we have to look at things in the broader way, I think in, in many foundational ways. Uh, I would say that uh, in order to be better uh, foundation in terms of AI, we need to even look at what is behind AI, which are like computational thinking, computing skills. And, and that uh, has to go a bit more, broad, more broadly in the society. I think having more people understand what uh, computers are. I mean, we all use computers now. But we use computers in terms of specific applications like PowerPoint and so on. Uh, but in terms of thinking about what are, what sort of problems can be formulated computationally mm. and how we can uh, learn more and more such problems that can then be solved using computers. And some of them are, are going to happen to be intelligent type of a task that can then be uh, uh, potentially improved over time uh, with AI. So, so that's, that's my <laughs> first take on it. Just, just a, a quick comment. <clears throat> there will always need to be a cadre of people who are developing the new AI methods, all right? And we actually have a very strong supply of such people in, in Singapore between the universities, ASTAR and um, <clears throat> AI Singapore, all right? But you actually don't need a large number of people doing that, you know, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, because a small number of people can create new algorithms that can then be used by many. Mm. Now, um, while there will always be a, a frontier of new things going on, the reality is organizations move much more slowly in their adaptation and deployment. And most organizations, there's some exceptions of this, but most organizations, most of the time, don't need to apply the most, you know, state-of-the-art algorithm. It's hard enough to get the data together and get all the other alignment that they need, right? So the vendors continue to put out the tools and the vendors continue to make tools that are easier to use. So uh, for not all, but for a lot of common company settings, the actual use of the tools will get easier. And we already see it. There's already a growing usage of these kind of tools. Now, 
understanding that you're using the tools thoughtfully, understanding that you're using the tools sensibly, understanding just because you can use data robot and literally by drag and drop and click, assuming you have the data set up, get a model or evaluate 10 models, you still need the understanding of, you know, is this plausible? Am I willing to go with it? So there, there's a lot of levels in the stack of what skill means. BK, did you want to add something to that? Yes, uh, I want to brag a little bit about SUTD. <laughs> uh, in, in SUTD, uh, we take great care in uh, trying to educate our students in quite a multidisciplinary way. They have uh, the first year, which is common. Everybody learns programming. And there is a course, a, co a core course, which is called computational thinking and design. Mm. And then they go into their pillars, what we call them pillars in mm. other universities. They would be called schools or departments. And uh, then they come back for a course called Capstone two term interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary design project where they again learn to speak each other's language and look at problems, not only from their disciplinary narrow lens, but to frame problems in a wider sense. Mm. So get a, get a problem statement and then question that problem statement in, a, in an interdisciplinary way. Mm. And I think that the skills that are needed in this field really need this kind of foundation. I'm sure SUTD mm. is not the only university doing this, but uh, I, I think that this, this kind of education is, is very much needed to achieve these kind of skills that Stephen was talking about. Mm. Just uh, Bryce, because uh, this is very important, most of our uh, listeners are from industry. Mm. Uh, the universities are doing their part. The universities in Singapore relative to the rest of the world are quite progressive in having the way they've moved into analytics and AI education. So I, I don't think the issue is the university. More of the issue is with the existing workforce. Mm -hmm. And industry just has to combine working and learning together. Mm -hmm. And they often do it through partnerships with vendors, through partnerships with service firms, sometimes through partnerships with the universities, participating in project courses. So there are a lot of ways where even small companies and you know even more easily medium and large companies can create a learning system where it isn't just sending people to class, mm. it's integrating learning and doing, mm. like doing trial and pilot projects in this area. And you know, if the industries commit to that, people are going to get the learning by doing experience cycles. Sounds great. Very, very, very exhaustive answer to that, I think very pregnant question in 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 Singapore. And and listening to you, it it really seems that you know, the, the successful toolbox for AI does not only involve uh, incredibly deep technical skills, but it's a much broader set of um, uh, thinking capabilities, understanding of problem statements and context, along with, uh, as uh, Hadi was mentioning, and you began understanding of, of, of what it means to think about things computationally, all of this together is actually some, some of the a group of of, of skills, not one very, very technical skills that, that people need to, 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 to master, if I'm hearing you guys correctly. Bryce, everything you mentioned is spot on. And let's, let's say you have the people, or whether you do it internally or work with a vendor, you've got the data, you've got the mm. model, you still have to go convince the other at parts of the company that to, to trust this, to use this. So a lot of so-called traditional change management efforts, you're still in that business in a big way and mm. you need humans to do that. Mm -hmm. And so building on that idea of, of, of multiple skills, multi multiple fields that needs to, 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 to a coalesce to actually reach a, a good outcome, there's that uh, topic that you mentioned, Stephen, it's very, very fasc fascinating. I, I, I knew of it as small data, but you were talking about thick data, which is bringing the concept even further, which is a, a diversity of different types of data, both computational and social and other kinds that apply to a very specific context is actually having 
uh, 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 yielding much deeper understanding of, as you were mentioning, the causality element to it, and and some of the 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 intricacies that needs to be understood in order to 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 address a problem. HDB is already engaged, and in, in, uh, URI probably as well in some some pilot and, and and initiatives where they're trying to collect the right social data, bring it with computational data, and and trying to bring that that deeper understanding. Do you have other examples of? such examples of, of thick data that are right now being deployed or piloted or tried out in Singapore that you find are especially interesting and represent examples that should be followed. BK, you might be the best one to take the first crack at that. Thank you. Yes. So this thick data, um, I think that thick data is used in general very much in relationship of computation in relationship with ethnography. So I believe that we have a number of people in Singapore who are doing ethnography from the field of social science, but also from the field of architecture and collaborating with, with others who are very much uh, experts in uh, technical development and combining this kind of data together to create this kind of thick data. We, we dabbed at this with, with the project that I showed with the Livable Places project, the informed design platform. But I think that uh, it can go much further uh, and, and some systems can be created where this thick data can make more use of these ethnographic results and methods uh, that are actually quite powerful. Even Hadi, do you have do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I actually want to comment on how difficult it is to get thick data. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I've been playing mostly in the e-commerce space. I mean, in a way, but it it, it, it kind of applies similarly elsewhere as well. Uh, a lot of things that we do online, uh, things that can, where data can actually be collected, they tend to be uh, one. They either tend to be splintered or partitioned across different silos. So bringing them together is going to be very hard. I mean, thinking about even our consumer purchasing behavior, we, we do things all over the place. We buy certain things. Some place we buy other things, other place and somewhere else. And putting them together uh, is not easy because they are all proprietary silos in, in that sense. Either that or a lot of this data are going to be unstructured uh, in, in that sense. I mean, so if we talk about social media data like Facebook, Twitter, uh, and so on, they're just like free text and congregating them into specific use cases, even thinking about like how this relates to housing, planning, uh, referring to specific locations. Uh, this is actually very hard to get. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the challenge of integrating them comes from uh, both in terms of the unstructured of the data, as well as in terms of the proprietary nature of that data itself. So the, the useful, uh, I, I can't recall a lot of examples where this kind of uh, data could easily be collected, unless there is an effort to create such uh, data sets uh, from the get-go. And, and achieving greater integration in the first place. And, and, and that's, I think, where uh, there, there may be the greatest value. But uh, at this point, I, I see a lot of challenges uh, in, in actually getting there at, as of now. Right. And, you know, as I've come to, as my, as my understanding of these things has evolved, of sort of looking at more applications, uh, I, I'm going to talk about the 80-20 rule. Now, I don't have evidence 80%, 20%. I'm using these terms qualitatively because I think most people sort of have a feel what you mean when you say 80-20, right? And for most companies, the 80 would be the transaction data, would be the things that they've been doing, they are doing, and they're going to be doing them in the future, if not exactly the same in a similar way. And they're getting more people involved in improving data quality and being able to get additional kinds of data, more attributes of the data into the big data data set, and it improves the quality of our predictions. Now, for people to be motivated to do that, they have to feel that they're going to be secure in their jobs, that doing that isn't going to lead to their own displacement. Mm. But they help with the quality control of the, what I refer to based on one of the papers in my presentation, typical data, typical in the sense that the prediction you're trying to make is for a future that's very similar 
to what you're doing now. And then at least sort of um, metaphorically speaking, the 20% is th there's stuff going on that's really different. It, we're trying to create some structural change. There's something in our environment, it's very much unlike the stuff that we regularly do. And there's where you need to build up the so-called thick data understanding. What's happening? You know, we, we, we don't have a lot of experience with it. It's not a big data database we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand the nature of the change and mm. some explanatory work, right? So th this notion that you need a stream to improve the quality of the big data and you need people working on that. And you probably need a smaller stream, but still nonetheless an ongoing stream of people working on the, the discontinuities, the new, the less structure to help pave the way for some new initiatives going forward. Fantastic. Um, there is a question that uh, popped up from uh, Enzo Caruba, uh, which points as, as something that is quite specific to something that you presented, Bigay, but I think it ask essentially a broader question. Uh, and Enzo is asking, how was the data of running people uh, taken? And was there any issue with personal protection? That links to the typical trade-off that people think or put in place, real or fake, between augment, uh, um, artificial intelligence and the threat that he can have to personal privacy, personal data, and whatnot. How does that, and I'm asking to, to, to be given, of course, the broader panel, how does the issue of personal data protection either limit or frame the way you're approaching your own personal work, your own personal research? And do you believe that that tension is actually a, a valid one or do you think it's more of a perceived one? Uh, I think it's a valid one, <coughs> definitely. Uh, with, this, with these large collections of data, um, Okay, I, I will try to be very politically correct here. So this, this data protection, we have to take great care of this as in the research community. We absolutely need to take great care for anonymized uh, data that is, calib that is uh, aggregated for some purposes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For the running data, uh, uh, Özgün, my PhD student, he scraped it from the app, uh, which was, you know, legally done. And he wrote this crawler, which then collected this data over the years into a database. Uh, most of the data was anonymous because it was deposited that way. Some of the data was not anonymous because the people who uploaded the data chose not to make it anonymous. We then did the data processing and anonymized all the data uh, and you know, got rid of all the, the, the personal information. And then it was, you know, according to some uh, demographic character, we didn't even have demographic characteristics in that specific set of data. So it was just running data. Uh, it was the uh, location which was recorded, if I remember correctly, every nine seconds. Uh, and that, that was it basically. So, um, but when it comes to other data, for example, the national science experiment data, uh, these are children where the data is collected from. So we follow the very, very, very strict protocol. We, the people collecting the data did not know, for example, the age of the students, the school of the students. We just knew if these are primary school, secondary school students, etc. But with the caveat, we did not do this but it can be done uh, from the, the data collection. If somebody wants, really, really wants to find out specific personal information, I think that it would not be very difficult to do so. So I believe that this is a very prominent and important question. It's a very important question that I do not have an answer for. I, I believe that this is a very, very important question. Adi, Stephen, do you, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I was thinking that uh, the personal data protection, I think it's really important that we should respect that. Uh, but uh, from the point of view of the AI machine learning technologies, I, I don't think it by itself is, is, an actual, is an actual barrier 
Mm. Because at the end of the day, uh, we don't have to have everybody's data. We just need to have a good sample of them. And to the extent that the sample is representative of the bigger population, uh, it's enough uh, to, to learn the, the, the new technologies that would eventually have applications to the rest of the population. So in some, to some extent, people who have their data protected have a free guide on, on the people who are disclosing their data. Now, in that sense, uh, some people are going to be willing to open up their data. I mean, uh, you know, if you just look at Instagram, you know, a lot of people are sharing things that we think are private. <laughs> I mean, some people are more willing to share data or, or even like this, uh, uh, people who are uh, the early adopters and, and, and people like that. Uh, even in the medical uh, industry, people who develop new drugs, there are always these people who volunteer to, to be part of the experiments. Mm. So I think in the long run, as, uh, as a lot more of us are using computers, generating data, I think that there's going to be some level at which for most people, data are going to be protected. But at some level, some piece of the data might actually be uh, made available for research for technology development. And, and that uh, would probably be sufficient to a large extent to, to, for the kind of applications that, that we are probably going to find acceptable. Yeah. Bryce, the one comment I have, and I'm speaking to our uh, industry participants, uh, as well as to some of our public sector participants, if you have the opportunity to do a project with one of the universities or the research institutes, but universities in particular, anytime they do an experiment that they're going to use related to their research and publication, it has to go through a review board that deals with all kinds of details about ways in which you're using any information about human subjects in your research. So my message is to the industry people, if you're working with a university on a project, don't worry about it because the review that they have to go through for their human subjects participation is so much more rigorous than you're ever going to think about that if it passes that, whatever special measures they need to um, take, they will do. So I want to encourage the industry people where they have the opportunity to do the experiments with the universities. And the universities will take care of the protocols for human subject participation. Absolutely. There you go. Problem solved. <laughs> Great. Uh, we're reaching the, the, the end of the of the time allotted to us. Uh, of course, Ju Judith will, will, I'm sure, uh, give us a, a final word. Uh, I just would like to uh, thank all of our panelists for such amazing presentations, such thoughtful answers on a wide range of topics, a couple of them indeed ex exceeding the, the, the scope. So thank you very much uh, for sharing all your thoughts. And uh, Judith, you can uh, take it away. Uh, thanks, Mr. Richard. Thank you to all our speakers, our moderator, Mr. Richard, and all participants once again. I would like to express our appreciation to everybody for taking time off their busy schedules to be with us today. Uh, before we end off today's session, uh, do allow me to make some announcements. Beyond Urban Analytics, if you are interested in learning more about our e-symposia series, we would like to invite you to visit our portal where you can view our webinars and share your suggestions to help us shape our RIE 2025 plans. The portal can be accessed via the QR code as shown here. Finally, as urban analytics is going to be a key focus of our Cities of Tomorrow research journey, we would like to strongly encourage you to fill up the survey that you will be auto-directed to once you close this webinar. If you have any other queries or ideas that you would like to share with us after this webinar, please do not hesitate to drop us an email. With that, we have come to the end of today's session, and we hope that you have found it insightful and productive. Judith, just one more comment. I think it might be useful to let everybody, I see we have 149 of our 214 still here, that I believe the PDF files from Bigay's um, presentation and mine, I believe we're making those publicly available, right? So you just might let people know if they do want to access the PDF versions, how they would find them. Uh, yeah, thank you, Prof Miller. It is uh, true that yeah, um, both panelists' uh, presentation slides will be made available on the portal. So if you would like to access them, I noticed that there are some questions in the Q&A section where people want to know more about the uh, research projects and case studies that were mentioned. So yes, you can access them using this portal. Uh, would you like to flash the QR code to the portal again? Yeah, we will be flashing that. Um, and. Aside from that, we have come to the end of today's session and we hope that you have yeah, found it insightful and productive.
Thank you all for joining us once again and do have a pleasant weekend ahead. Goodbye.